Hello, and thank you for finding this YouTube channel. My name is Jonathan Wilson. I'm the pastor at Salem Covenant Church in rural Pennock, West Central Minnesota. We are continuing our Cole Porter Christmas series. This that I am about to read uh, is not a sermon. It is a reflection on the incarnation of Jesus Christ, uh, which is told in John chapter 1 as uh, the Word made flesh. And the author is Johann Arndt. It's part of his volume that he wrote early in the 1600s called True Christianity. And it has been reproduced uh, in translation uh, by this series called the what Classics of Western uh, Spirituality, published by the Paulist Press uh, way back in 1979. 1979. Now, the uh, person of Johann Arndt looms large in the history of the movement that produced the Evangelical Covenant Church. He was uh, a German Lutheran who did his writing uh, at the outset of the 1600s, really before the Thirty Years' War got underway. Um, and he anticipated much of what later German Lutheran pastors would uh, want to recover after the Thirty Years' War in order to revive spirituality in the uh, Protestant churches of Germany. And so, they, and so Philip Jacob Spener, a German Lutheran a pastor in Frankfurt and the superintendent of pastors in that city, uh, he recovered the uh, works of Johann Arndt he wrote a foreword uh, for a, a republication of this volume, and then that foreword, uh, which is called Pious Wishes, became its own standalone volume and uh, became the framework out of which pietist Christianity took shape within the Protestant evangelical framework. So. The importance of Johann Arndt cannot be uh, discounted. The uh, Lutheran scholars Maria Erling and Mark Gramquist, as they described the history of the Augustana Synod, said that the, those early Swedish uh, immigrant pastors coming to plant Swedish immigrant uh, Lutheran churches uh, across the Midwest uh, they, they described them as all of them carried Johann Arndt with them in their saddlebags. Uh, so the, uh, the early Swedish uh, pastors coming to North America uh, were pietist in their outlook and uh, were still reading uh, the original Johann Arndt. Would you pray with me? Dear God, we thank you for this time that we can continue to study your word, continue to, uh, to honor the past and how it was that the, the founding generation of um, those who put Salem together and those who put the covenant denomination together, how they understood faith, how they uh, came to uh, hear it and to be converted and to put it into practice and how we continue uh, in those priorities to the present uh, in order to embrace our future and all that you have in store for us. Uh, Lord, open up our hearts then to hear these voices from the past um, in order that uh, our faith for the future might continue to be shaped and formed. In Jesus' name, amen. This comes from Book 5 of True Christianity. And uh, he begins his uh, chapter 2 with the statement, The union of God with man is demonstrated through the image of God in man. 
The image of God in man is that conformity with God in which the likeness of the invisible God is vitally published and shines forth, namely as a likeness of goodness, righteousness, holiness, immortality, wisdom, mercy, might, power, faith, and so forth. These characteristics, since they are essentially and infinitely together in God, God himself wishes to express in humankind as a living portrait and image. Every likeness begets love, but love results in attraction and union. What ought God to bind and unite to himself better and firmer with love than his own image and likeness? Where ought God to dwell more than in his own image? With whom ought he to unite himself more lovingly than with those whom he has created to be his image and likeness? God the Father is in his only begotten Son, the eternal and essential image of God, the eternal Father. Here the essential union of the Father and his image shines forth most clearly. As a likeness of this union, however, and to copy it, the dear God, according to his infinite goodness, wished also to be united with created human beings by a gracious indwelling. For this reason he ignited the light of true and perfect knowledge in man's reason, so that God himself, with the light and beam of his divine wisdom, might shine within us. The affection of purest and most perfect love he planted in the heart of human beings, so that God, who is love itself, might be strong and active through human love. The perfect righteousness, holiness, and truth God placed in human will, so that he himself might bring forth and practice righteousness, holiness, and truth through humankind. However, without the indwelling and union of God with humankind, this could in no way occur unless God would unite himself with humankind by his image and likeness. How supremely good, glorious, and lovely is the statement of the Holy Trinity because of this, when God decided and said, let us make humankind in our image. In Genesis 1, verse 26, this is as much to say, let us make humankind to be a living mirror of our divine light and wisdom, our love and goodness, our righteousness and holiness, our truth and immortality, our might and glory, so that we might be seen and shine forth in humankind in our loving image. What is God's image in humanity other than a clear and renewed, brightly shining beam of the unspeakable goodness of God? This goodness indeed has its source and essence in God. In humankind, however, it is a beautiful divine adornment and precious grace out of which the great divine goodness and glory gleam forth and shine. The essential image of the Son of God is called the light of glory, Hebrews 1 verse 3, so that in the essential image of God the Father, glory might shine forth as the glory of the only begotten Son of the Father. Why ought the gracious image of God in man not be simply called a bright, renewed light of divine goodness? Oh, the unspeakable love and gentleness of God, which no one's intellect can grasp. What more will the elect be when they are like God and see him as he is himself? 1 John 3, 2. Finally, the perfect union with God will occur. The conformity with God will be perfect. The greater and more perfectly the image of God shines in us in this life, the greater is that union with God. Therefore, by the perfect image and likeness, 
the perfect union will be brought about and completed, namely, when we see him as he is. Therefore, the perfection and full pleasure of humankind is union with God. Union with God is, however, the greatest blessedness, while rejection and separation is the greatest unholiness and misery. Chapter 3, by the word of God, a union of God and man is established. That the divine revealed word is a bond of the union between God and man, the very first commandment testifies. That commandment was given to man in paradise, and by it the Lord God bound man fast to himself. By the act of of disobedience, the disillusion and division of the most holy union immediately followed, and the image of God was lost. Nothing is nor can be called more disturbing, frightening, and abominable, for when humankind lost the image of God, we lost ourselves and fell from light into darkness, from truth into lies, from righteousness into unrighteousness, from holiness into all kinds of shame and sin, from the glorious and beautiful adornment into an abominable, hateful nakedness, from freedom into heavy servitude and the power of the devil, from life into death, from heaven into hell, from paradise into external misery, from health into many and manifold illnesses, from the greatest wealth into the deepest poverty, from blessed rest into hard and heavy work, from the sweetest pleasure and joy into all sorts of sorrow, anguish, and pain. And what is worse, in the fall itself, a most regretful division from God began, flight, from the face of God, a servile fright and shame, a thick darkness in man's reason and understanding, a turning of the will from God, a stubbornness and hardness of heart and enmity against God, so that the prophet does not, without reason, write, your sins separate you from God. Isaiah chapter 59 verse 2. This most lamentable division and separation from God might have remained for all eternity had not the Word come between and reestablished and made union with God. God called man through the Word out of his flight to himself from darkness to light, from lies to truth, from death to life, from doubt to grace. Man was ashamed and acknowledged his hateful nakedness. God pointed out that he had overstepped his law. He ordered the serpent before him and cursed it, but took man again into grace and promised an intercessor who would avenge him and named this intercessor the seed of woman who would crush the serpent. Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. In this manner, God, our gracious Father, once more took up humanity, which had broken his word, and united humankind with himself. Thus, from the beginning, the implantation of the sanctifying word was nothing other than a binding and union of man with God. Thus, man's soul and mind, which by sin had been separated from God, were united again with him, so that the All-Highest again built and established his seat and dwelling place within us. The Word of God is the wagon on which God travels. References there are Ezekiel 1 verse 15 and Zechariah 6 verse 1. Out of the mouth of God the Word proceeds united with the Holy Spirit. So says Isaiah chapter 59 verse 21. 
If this word is despised and set aside, God himself bypasses man and leaves him. Because you have cast out my word, I have cast you out, says he who gave the word. 1 Samuel 15, verse 23. The Lord God binds himself to the word when he says, I am with you according to the word by which I have made a covenant with you. My spirit will remain with you. Haggai chapter 2, verses 5 through 6. How could the union with God through the word be more clearly indicated? Indeed, the memory, honor, and service of God, insofar as it is directed to him, binds God to us. As Exodus 20, verse 24 says, In all places where the memory of my name is established, I will come to you and bless you. In the word and holy sacraments, the proper memory of the name of God is established. Therefore, he will unite with us by word and sacrament. This our Savior in beautiful and loving words affirmed, He who loves me will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our dwelling place with him. Therefore, it is called a word that enlightens our eyes, a word of salvation, a life-giving word, a permanent seed of God, and a power of God. God, however, is the power that works in us. Truly, it is fitting that God's presence, activity, and union enlighten us, give us new birth and life. Since this occurs through the word, it is necessary that God himself be present in and with the word. There come, in addition, the gracious promises of God, which bind and unite God and humankind together. Fear not, says the Lord, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, and I will help you. I will uphold you. Isaiah 41, verse 10. And again, in Isaiah 43, verse 2, when you pass through the water and walk through the fire, I will be with you. With these dear consoling promises, God places himself in our hearts. In addition to this, there is the oath that he swore to us, which is a firm bond of the union of God with humankind. Through this word and prophecy, the revelation of the word of God came to the apostles and prophets. Therefore, it is called God's word and a voice having gone forth from God because the spirit of God spoke it through the mouth of the prophets and holy men of God spoke inspired by the Holy Spirit. 1 Peter 1 verse 22. This could not have occurred without the special union of God with humankind. This union is clearly shown and demonstrated in that it is written that the holy prophets and apostles were filled with the Holy Spirit to make known the Word of God. Luke chapter 1 verse 70. In addition, God's help and presence itself belongs to true consolation by which troubled and contrite hearts are raised up and made to live. This the prophet gives witness to in Isaiah 57 verse 15. The royal prophet David also was satisfied with no consolation unless he had and possessed God himself. Psalm 73, verse 25. The souls of those who fear God are satisfied with no good except God himself. Psalm 34, verse 8. Chapter 4, the incarnation of the Son of God, is the chief foundation and demonstration of the union with God. Before his incarnation, the Son of God often appeared to the fathers in human form so that he might strengthen and confirm their faith and hope in the coming incarnation. Is not the union of divine and human nature a certain and unerring mark and sign of the union of God with humankind? The loving and Consolatory name, Emmanuel, given in the prophet Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 14, also testifies to this. It does not only mean 
living with. It also means that Christ lives in those who have become his members and makes us alive and creates in us the spiritual life. As the Apostle Paul writes in Romans 8 verse 10, for this reason, the Apostle Paul commands us that we are to test and seek this indwelling within us. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Indeed, Paul considers this indwelling of Christ in us a certain sign of the coming glory of which he speaks when he writes Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. The holy body of our Lord is the holiest temple and dwelling in which the complete fullness of the divinity dwells bodily. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. Thus, God made the hearts of faithful men as his holy place and dwelling, as the apostle indicates in Ephesians 2, 22, and the Son of God made this known earlier in John 14, 20. Oh, the miraculous worth of the faithful bodily community of blessedness that is above all things. Chapter 5, concerning the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And with this, we conclude this study. How great a relationship, community, and union of the highest and eternal God with humankind is established, is clearly witnessed by three chief works of grace. First, the creation of humankind in God's image. Second, the incarnation of the Son of God. Third, the sending of his Holy Spirit. Through these great works, the Lord God revealed and made clear the purpose for which humankind was created, was redeemed, and was made holy. Namely, that he might enjoy communion with God in which the highest and only blessedness of man can consist. Therefore, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. John 1, verse 14. The Holy Spirit was sent down from heaven so that we might establish also this communion and union of God with humankind. We have great need of the Spirit of God so that we might be freed and loosed from the spirit of this world. We have great need of the spirit of wisdom, Isaiah 11, 2, so that we might love the highest good. And the spirit of understanding is very necessary for us so that we might be able to wisely carry out the responsibilities of our calling. Likewise, we need the spirit of counsel so that we might bear the cross in patience and the spirit of strength and of power so that we might conquer the world and the devil and indeed the spirit of understanding so that we might shun vices and evils and the spirit of childlike fear so that we might be pleasing to God in addition the spirit of grace and of prayer so that we might call upon God in all our needs and be able to praise his grace and goodness in all his works. We have been chosen as the children of God in Christ Jesus, as the Apostle makes clear in Romans 8.16 and Ephesians 2.13. Because of this, God, our dear Father, wished to strengthen this great grace, which is also a spirit of God the Son, so that he might make us partakers of the divine nature as true and proper children who are born of God and remain in God as it is written in 1 John 4.13. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us his own spirit. A true natural son does not only have the flesh and blood of his parents, but also their manner of life and mind. In like manner, those who are born of God must have God's Spirit and bear something godly in ourselves. Galatians 4, verse 6. Because of his only begotten Son, God took us up as his children. He has also established us as his heirs and co-heirs with his Son, Jesus Christ. Therefore, he gave us the Spirit the seal of the coming inheritance, 
with whom he sealed us for the life of glory. Ephesians 1.13 He also cleansed us with his spirit in witness of the received but still hidden royal worth and glory. As we have been led and directed with wisdom, doctrine, and knowledge of eternal salvation, so we have received the purification of the Spirit. We are also purified with this oil of joy against the world and the devil's foolishness and raging, so that we might not suffer the Heavenly Father poured into our hearts his love through the Holy Spirit. Because we are often spotted and unclean because of the impurity of our own flesh, he also gave us the spirit of holiness so that we might continually grow up again and be cleansed, as the Apostle says in 1 Corinthians 6, 11 and Romans 8, 9. Finally, because we must have a life-giving spirit against death, God our Father sanctified our bodies as temples and dwelling places for the Holy Spirit, as the Apostle teaches in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and Romans 8, 11. And these are the outcomes of that great miracle. The Word become flesh to dwell among us in union with the Spirit, that we might also inherit of that union and inherit the resurrection of the dead with Jesus Christ, our brother, and God, our Father. Thank you for joining us for this reflection on true Christianity by Johann Arndt.